This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and we're going to talk about gardening. Got a few things on my mind, but it ain't about me, folks. My garden is taking care of itself, except what will you know, I try to be in here for the first time in 11 or 12 years in the summertime. I actually planted some stuff that would need me. You know, I haven't planted tomatoes in a long time or a lot of vegetables or, or summer annuals that need at least a little care every now and then because I'm, I was gone for months from May until September. Anyway, this spring and um, early summer, I've set out some stuff that actually needs to be taken care of. I feel needed. And uh, if dragging a hose makes you feel accomplished, I am accomplished. For, but anyway, for the next little while, we're going to talk about what's on your gardening mind. Uh, lawns, trees, shrubs, flowers, herbs, vegetables, diseases, insects, fungus, mm, design, you know, whatever you want to talk about. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm a horticulturist. I've worked at garden centers and nurseries and landscape companies. But, you know, I'm thinking, what would I do? You know, with the, all the resources at my disposal, but knowing that it's also just me doing it, what would I do? And that's going to be my first approach with you, too. So anyway, if you want to give us a call, it's toll-free, one eight seven seven mpb ring And we're going to start out way on up in the northeast corner of the state in um, Corinth and talk to Mike. Hey, Mike. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. How are you today? So far, so good. I walked in today, as I usually do, two miles, and it is humid. So I'm, sw- <laughs> I'm I mean, I've just got rivulets running down my face. It's hot up here, too. What's up? Uh, I just had a comment, uh, something I'm guilty of, and I'm sure a lot of gardeners are. We tend to be impatient. Uh, instead of waiting, uh, I tend to water fertilize and so forth and want everything to happen at once so yeah. we should just uh just wait i think there's a passage in psalms that says wait on the lord so i, I think uh if i listen to that i'd be better off uh, <laughs> no no and not listen to it but practicing it practice that's right <laughs> But anyway, that's that's the only comment I had. I hope you have a good day. I appreciate that. That's a great way to kick up. But let me ask you this, Mike. What are you impatient to get done? Uh, nothing extra important. It's just, you know, if you're a gardener of any kind, and I won't say everybody's like this, but uh, I am at times. I'm mostly uh, ornamental yeah. horticulture. But, uh it you does, know, you, uh, it, not just gardening, you, you get impatient on a lot of things. It, it does feel good to do something, you look over your shoulder and see that you did it. You know, me, I, I make up my bed in the morning, first thing every morning, in a little, little, a little cabin, but I make my bed up, straighten the pillows up, straighten out the little quilted on top, and I feel like I've got a grip for the rest of the day. And I, I imagine a lot of people feel the same way mowing their yard. It's a kind of a chore, but when they get done, they feel good about something they did that day. Yeah, uh, I've been in the military. You've been in the military. Yeah, uh-huh. and I, think, I think military kind of teaches you a little patience. And yes, structure and hurry up and forth. wait. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, it's, it's a great sentiment this morning. I hope you can relax. And, uh, and if you just feel the urge to just get out and do something, talk to your medical doctor and see if he can prescribe you a little Wellbutrin. It works for me. <laughs> Pre- <Okay. laughs> appreciate it, Mike. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> okay, let's come back to Jackson and talk with Jim. Hey, Jim, good morning, sir. Good morning, Felder. Jim Rosenblatt here. Hey, I want to pre- I want to thank you, uh, Dean, for sending me that that uh, Madison uh, magazine that had an article uh, about me uh, by me about about gardening in the South. I pre I didn't know that they had published it, but thank you. It was a really nice article. Thank you, sir. It made me feel tall and smart. <laughs> what, what you got going on this morning? Um, my tomatoes haven't been setting the last couple of weeks, and at first I blamed the bees, but is it the weather? Yep, yep, yep. You know, our, our, all of our garden, you know, this is my first year to plant tomatoes and corn and sweet potatoes and peas and squash in a little special new area, and it rained and rained and rained, and plants got real stretchy and, and full of vigor, and then the rain stopped, it turned hot, and, uh, and, and that combination caused these plants are a little bit overstretched. To feel overstretched, they you know they they didn't you know you're you're a retired military guy. They overstretched their supply lines. 
Well, I, I guess putting a fan out there wouldn't help, would it? <laughs> no. Uh, you, you, we have plenty of wind. Uh, tomatoes are, are, are self-pollinated. You, you know, vibration. I mean, insects will work the flowers, but the flowers, all they need is a little vibration to shake the pollen loose in the flower, and wind will usually do that. But uh, what I did was I just planted some more tomatoes for fall. You know, we got we got, still got a couple of weeks or so where you can do that. So, you know, rather than keep those plants alive all summer with their tongues dragging in the in the dust, think about setting a, a few more out this uh, this week or next week if you can. But, and those well, will produ- start- they'll produce a lot better this fall than the ones you're trying to keep alive. Yeah, I've started some from seed, so they're about three inches tall. So I think I'll do that. Put them, they, they're getting plenty of sunshine during the day. They are good because those little seedlings they'll get sturdy and stocky if they get real sunshine. So sound like you're pretty well on track, Dean. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Felder. I appreciate your call. Thank you. Uh, before we go any further, let me mention I'm going to give a, a, a web address, not a web address, but a place to go for two different things that some of you might find interesting. Uh, one is the petition. I, I, I met with the uh, I was at the first meeting of the Mississippi Flag Commission. Java, I hadn't even told you about this, but I found out about it. And I sneaked in as a member of the media. You know, I, I've used MPB, I guess. Uh, but I sat in on they they started the new uh, flag commission. Uh, Judge Reuben Anderson is a, is a chairperson of it, and he's going to do a great job. Um, but there's a petition, and they've already got over 600 submissions for people with ideas of flags, and they're going to narrow them down to the what they think, working with flag experts, are the top five, and then they're going to put it out for people to give input. Well. I just would like to see at least one of them, maybe all of them, at least one of them have a magnolia flower on it because we're the magnolia state. Avenue of Ma- everything about 1949, every historic monument's got a magnolia flower on it. Not the old tree. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for it, but it's a branding thing. Anyway, there's a petition to ask them to at least consider a magnolia flower on the flag. And if you'd like to participate, it's got hundreds of signatures already, uh, thanks to a lot of y'all. If you'd like to, to, to read a little bit about that uh, and then possibly consider doing the petition, uh, this website will take you to it. But the same website has a a brand new thing. I did a program for the Department of Archives and History uh, Wednesday. Uh, big auditorium. It was done live, but they put it online. It's uh, a lecture, you know, and there's no lectures. There's no things about me giving my garden talk about slow gardening and pass along plants and heirloom plants and native plants and sharing with others and yard art. Anyway, I put everything, including the kitchen, literally the kitchen sink into this presentation. And it's it, you can see it online. Um there's a link to take it to. It's done by the Mississippi Department of Archi- Archi- Archives and History, MDAH. So if you Google their website, click on their Facebook thing, it'll take you to it. But I've got both of them on my blog, felderrushing.blog. Not my website, not .net, felderrushing.blog. Uh, the opening menu has got a thing about magnolia flower flag, and it's got a thing about... Um, my my biographical it says Felder bio stuff. Anyway, if you click on either of those, it'll take you to these two things I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm not trying to be vain here, but I had a lot of fun putting this program together. And um, I, yeah, some of you might like to see some pictures of my yard. Who knows? But anyway, enough of that. Well, I'll mention it again a little bit later. But uh, meanwhile, uh, let's go down to Gulfport to the Gulf Coast. Hey, Wayne, good morning, and thanks for holding. Hey, good morning. What's, uh, what's up? I, I, I should tell you up front that... I am probably the least knowledgeable tree and garden person that's ever called into your show. That's the reason I got a job, man. Bring it on. <laughs> well, I'll keep you employed. I have a beautiful, thriving shade tree right outside on my, uh, at my back deck. And the bottom three feet of the base of the tree are starting to deteriorate like it's being eaten away so the bark is gone and it started over the course of the last couple of years it started to eat into the tree yeah. and i don't know what kind of tree it is but i can give you two clues would that help uh it, it'd be better if you could send me a really good clear close-up picture of the leaves oh sure and, and, and the other thing is also take a pretty good clear picture you know make sure it's not too contrast where i could actually see what the problem is if you got trunk de- you know trunk decay is it an old tree 
Well, I've owned the house 17 years. It's been here as long as I've been. Here. Yeah. Well, that tree went through, all the trees on the coast have gone through some terrible conditions, back and forth, you know, with drought and rain and wind, unbelievable wind and all that. So all yeah. of them have got, all the old trees have got some kind of internal decay. Uh, and I can, you know, make a couple of suggestions, but in general, and keep in mind, I taught the tree surgery course. I've been working with this for a long time. Okay. There's not a lot that people can do about uh, trunk decay. You know, that idea of digging it out, putting concrete in it, that's cosmetics only. It's just cosmetics. Uh, so there's not a lot you can do. But my rule of thumb is if the damage isn't more than about a third of the way around total, the tree's probably still got good structural integrity. In other words, it's not likely just to fall over as if it, you know, if it was more than halfway around, you'd have some problems. And it's not. It's just as starting to eat into this one sort of side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Take a take a oh. knife or a screwdriver or something and just lightly dig around in there and see if it's actually decaying into the trunk, and then send me a picture of it. But okay. uh, but in in general, uh, other people might tell you other stuff. You know, the pruning paint. Not much you can do about it. And and, and we can identify the tree also if you send me some some pictures of the leaves. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, relax, man. Let's have uh, let's just breathe in and breathe out. I'm trying. <laughs> With a mask on, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Put a mask on, breathe in and breathe out. Okay, uh, no. thank you. you bet. Appreciate it. Now it's going to go to McGee. Hey, uh, is it uh, is it Ika Ika Magnolia? <laughs> it, it, hello, who is this? Greetings. This is Ika Crawford. Ika. In Magnolia, the, Magnolia, I know the county seat of Pike County. Former, isn't it the former? I think Macomb is the county seat now, huh? Yeah, we we you know, we'll still stick with the old stuff. I love the Magnolia. Good. I wish they make it the flag. Well, so go, sign the petition anyway. For what what can I help you with today? I was wondering. I took some cuttings this spring of blueberries and a couple of other trees, and they're in one-gallon pots now. Mm -hmm. Should I keep them in the pots until next spring or plant them now? Uh, I would, I would, if they're still alive, that means they've got roots on them. They would probably do better in pots over the next couple of months than in the ground because you put it in the ground, you're going to have to water it without keeping it too wet. So what I would do is I would give it, if they've been in there for at least a couple of months, we think they got roots, give it a little bit of fertilizer, about half strength of what the directions call for. Give it, give them some sunshine, water them, and then let's, uh, and I go ahead and start digging the holes where you want them. Uh, even though it's a little trouble, but dig it a little at a time, and then set them out this fall in, pre in soil that's already prepared. They'll grow good roots over the winter, and they'll be established by next spring. But uh, I, I don't think I would put them out a new plant with tender roots. I don't think I'd put them out in, in this kind of – the next couple of months are going to be tough on a, on a plant with not a lot of roots. So just keep them in a pot and plant them this fall. Okay, thank you. Could thank I ask you. one more question? Sure. Oh, okay. Is there a trick to taking cutting in the summer months? Specifically, um, I have the. I know there's a European and an Asian pear tree. Uh -huh. We have the hard cooking pear. Yep, that was probably called kefir. Starts with a K. Can I take cuttings from this tree? You, and uh, you I can, can take them. Well, let me let me just give you and other listeners three general rules of thumb. You know, and I, you know, plant propagation is one of my things. I did it before I went to college. I taught the class. Blah 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 blah. In general, plants that drop their leaves in the winter root best in the winter. That's just a real general thing. You know, roses. Uh, although, so if they drop the leaves in the winter, better to take cuttings in the winter. If they're evergreen. They root best on new growth in the summertime, azaleas and hollies and things like that. So in general, uh, things like the, the pears and all, I'd wait. Um, also, in general, if you want to try to root stuff in the summer, they need energy from the sun, but they won't take hot sun because they don't have any roots. So find a place that's really bright, that's not direct sun, but as bright as you can get, and then make a little plastic tent, like a little miniature greenhouse, to keep the humidity real high. And that'll keep the leaves from drying out so fast. So the idea is keep the leaves on those cuttings long enough for them to send energy down and start growing some roots. So high humidity, bright, indirect light. In general, that's that, that's what most propagators do. 
can the indirect light come from a like regular LED light it, that they it, should sell it, at the hardware store? It'd be a lot better to, because of the humidity and the warmth outside. It'd be a whole lot better to, to find a, a shady spot out in the yard because it's also war- warm temperatures and stuff. We keep our, our homes you know, in the 70-ish range, these plants really like 85, 90, you know, warmth and humidity and indirect light. So it'd be better to make your little place out on a place that doesn't get maybe a little early morning sunshine, but not mid-day or afternoon sun. Thank you. Okay. And good. thank you for your show. I listen to it, like, all the time for well, the last three years. Well, we appreciate, I appreciate you. you. I appreciate you being part of it. Thank you so much. All righty. Uh, we'll take another call and then a little bit of a break. I found a, a, a little piece of a cheesy tune. It's not a cheesy tune. It's a couple of old curmudgeons singing something, that, you know, because we play nice music all the time, sweet stuff. Well, this is for the curmudgeons out there. But uh, meanwhile, let's go up to South Haven. Hey, Barbara, how are you? I'm fine. How about you? Good so far. I'm good. Listen, I've got a couple of questions. One is on a hosta. Mm-hmm. I have in a pot. And the leaves are starting to fall off, and I think maybe this could be root rot, but then I look at the base of the leaves, and it's got little white specks, and Mm. my leaves are falling off. It, it could be an insect. Uh, you know, hostas are pretty durable plants, but if you grow them in containers, you run the risk of them either staying too dry between soakings or worse, keeping them too wet. And I've got hostas in pots in my yard. They get watered, I'm going to say maybe twice a week. Okay. And and these are these are big hostas in medium sized pots. So I don't keep them wet all the time because we want them to have good deep roots. And the only way to do that is to put the water down deep and let the top part dry out so the roots will reach down for the moisture. So if you're watering a lot, hold yeah. back on the frequency. Okay. Is there anything I can do to stop it? Oh, uh, one thing you can do, and hostas are pretty durable. Though I'm going to say they're moderately durable. You might want if you've got more than one. Well, just one that's doing that. What I would do is I would I would risk uh, weakening it a little bit by trying to save it. I would gently pull it out, loosen up the roots, maybe cut some of the older leaves off, all but a few leaves, take a look at it, and if it looks okay, just trim off all but a few leaves and repot it in some better uh, 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 potting soil. Uh, hostas can take, some plants want, hostas can, can take it, as long as you trim off all but just a few new leaves, mm-hmm. and then, you know, let, sort of clean it off, wash the roots and stuff, and repot it, and then uh, hold back on the f- fertilizer, half strength. Oh, okay. What and, about? Uh, you know, that, that might save it. Okay. What about root stimulator? Pure gimmick. Pure gimmick. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to say pure gimmick. It's, uh, uh, it's the, the active ingredient in it is helpful, but it's less than half of a percent. It's mostly oh. water, and the plants g- typically have that much in them to begin with. So it, the, the, the best reason I can think of for using a root stimulator is it makes you think about watering your plants. Oh, okay. and and you know for for five dollars a, a jar, I don't need the help. Okay. <laughs> but the main, main thing is uh, to try not to keep them too wet. I think that's what's happened to it. it. It's real, real. You know, I get I get emails from people who water and water and water every day, and their plants are looking bad. I have mm-hmm. dozens of plants in containers, big containers, little containers, and I don't think there's a single plant that I've got that gets watered more than twice a week. And I, I've been doing this a long time. Then another question, Peruvian daffodils. Mm-hmm. I've got one or two that's on, just ending their second bloom, uh-huh. and I dig them up now and move them. You you can, but you know this is these these subtropical plants. You know they tend to grow. If you're going to do that, cut the leaves back. You know and what this does? It takes the stress. It, you know it takes the workload off because when you move a plant up. When you move it, you leave a lot of the roots behind. Let's balance that by cutting some of the leaves. Just cut the leaves half in two, and they should put out some new growth just fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Barbara, really, really appreciate your call. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. All righty, folks. Um, I came up with a really, just a little short clip. This, this, this tune, my favorite verse is by Willie Nelson because he's such a sweetheart. But I found a couple of old guys just bragging and laughing about getting old. I thought we'd play it. about a minute long. Is that all right? Well, get down to your little toe, then you can holler. (laughs) (laughs) Now, 
don't be ashamed of your age. Lord, no. And don't let the years get you down. Oh, boy. That old can you do. Yeah. They still think of you. I wonder. As around here in your old hometown. I hear you, Jim. Now, don't mind the gray in your hair. Uh-uh. Just think about all the fun you had putting it there. Yeah, boy. As far as that old book of time, you've never skipped a page. Everybody. But don't be ashamed of your age, Mr. George John. I hear you, Jim. Don't be ashamed of your age. Get you down. Ain't got me yet, son. Why life ain't begun until you're 40, son. I'm back. That's when you really start to go to town. I wish I could go back to 40. Now, don't wish that you were last. No. Why, boy, you've lost more gals than they've ever had. I'd like to thank you. Listen, you graduated from that old sucker stage. I'm listening, boy. So don't be ashamed of your age. Yeah. I hear you, John. Don't be ashamed of your age Don't be ashamed of the thing of all the fun you've had putting on gray hair there. You know, that's for all the curmudgeons out there who just like to feel, well, they're having a pretty good time. We can take just a little minute, minute and a half or so break, do a little business here at Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Me and Java and all the other folks here at MPB. We really appreciate you being part of this program and for supporting us and all. I got a proper uh, cheesy tune coming up in just a little while, but we've got the lines open. If you want to give us a call and talk about gardening, if it's related at all about gardening, we're going to talk about it. We'd like to also point you to the uh, felderrushing.blog and click at the bottom either Magnolia Flower Flag or click on Bio Stuff to watch a little uh clip that the Mississippi Department of Archives and History did of my, my latest lecture about pass along plants and slow gardening and heirlooms and sharing with other folks. We're going to take a real quick break and come back with more of the Gestalt Gardener here on MPB right after this. contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult and yes you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things listen to Fix It 101 podcast everywhere. Alrighty back folks back 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 to the Gestalt Gardener. <laughs> we do have some a little cheesy tune coming up in just a second. Uh, would like to, to uh, remind you, that's a live program. And if you have questions during the week, shoot me an email, garden at mpbonline.org. Now, while Bob's been hanging on in Fairhope for a long time. Hey, Bob, thank you for holding. What's up, man? An old fig tree. It's probably 15 feet around in terms of uh, its canopy. Uh-huh. Um, it starts to fruit in around the 4th of July. It finishes now. And then it loses all of its leaves. They yeah. turn ugly looking and spotted, and it looks like winter in you know late August. So yeah. is this customer? It's it's not customary, but it's not uncommon either. Uh, we have uh, several different fungi disease. Keep in mind that figs are native to the Mediterranean, which is a different climate. It's not as humid. It's drier. And, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 uh, most of the time, figs can take it no problem at all. I just pick some figs up. Uh, I guess it was Tuesday. I, I picked some fig. Monday or Tuesday, I picked some and put up some preserves. But it's not it's not normal from the drop the leaves. But it's kind of common a combination of of uh, a lot of top growth, maybe some poor root systems. You know, on the coast in your sandy soils, you might actually have a type of microscopic worm called nematodes that are feeding on the roots that weaken it. We and, definitely have nematodes here. Okay. Well, well, what happens is uh, when roots get damaged or the top grows bigger than the plants can. Can can maintain you know just big enough to maintain it. Then all of a sudden it turns hot and dry, and one more stress, the plant preserves itself by dropping its leaves. So the good news is, if they fall off, the tree's not dead. It's when they 
turn around and stick on that you got problems. So what I would think about uh, doing was sometime this winter, or you could even do this now, but this winter, cut some of the, the stems back. You know, you can cut some of those trunks back to two feet tall, let them sprout back out, and sort of rejuvenate the tree. You could do it all at once and, and lose your figs for one year, or you could do it some this year and some next year. But uh, but but cut it, cut the tree back, let it put out some new growth, and uh, this sort of creates a new tree. And, yeah, uh, actually, I've I've seen some some pretty nice root growth. The, the main trunks of this are probably, I'm going to say, three to four inches around. It's a it's a big old tree. Oh yeah, that, my my great grandmother's fig tree that I helped her make fig preserves in when I was ten years old is still producing figs. But mm-hmm. at the same time, though, over time they get internal decay, they get root rot, they get stem rot, and it's a good idea, just like with any kind of older. And I wish we could do this to ourselves, just cut part of us off and start over again. But it, <laughs> and and that kind of hard pruning is actually called rejuvenation pruning. And, okay, uh, and that's all all the trunks, the the, the well, ones that are maybe an inch you, around. And- you 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 can if you want to, or you could do some this year. You know how the tree's got some really tall parts. You might want to cut those parts back and leave some of the smaller outer stuff, and then next year, you know, swamp. Okay, but uh, you know that, that'll take the the stress off the roots. There are some some fungi. There's some diseases that'll cause uh, uh, figs to defoliate, but usually there's gonna be some real obvious little ra- big round spots on the leaves. Yeah, this this tree looks amazingly uh, healthy right up until all the fruit's gone, and then it within a, a matter of three or four weeks. Well, this is a this is a, a pure but overeducated guess that I'm thinking to say it's got uh, it's got more top than the roots can handle. It might be nematodes. Who, who knows what the problem is? But it, okay. the classic uh, uh, root stress. Okay, well, then I will prune back in the fall or winter, rather, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think, I think winter's best. You could do it now, but I guarantee you there's a yellow jacket nest out there somewhere. Oh, so. I've seen them. Yeah, so I've stayed away <laughs> since I did my harvest. <laughs> okay, good luck on it, man. Great. Thank you, sir. You Bye. bet. Now, we got a guy named Jerry. Jerry's been hanging on. He's on the road. Where are you, Jerry? Jerry? I'm, east of, I'm east of Tupelo going to South Carolina. All right. Reason. East of Tupelo, you... You headed into the you're heading into the hills, man. I am. Oh, well, in Ashland, Mississippi, my backyard, I had a volunteer garlic plant a while ago, and I've never cut it down. And every year, you know, it blooms and spreads and blooms and spreads. And now, uh, you know, bigger than a pizza pan, the uh, the size of the, the patch. I was just wondering what's the best way and best time. The transplants on that in South Carolina. Okay, now, now, what kind of plant? I, I heard you say gara. Is that? Did you say garlic? Go, garlic. Oh, garlic, garlic, garlic. Yeah, that's going to be a clump. It's going to be a bunch of, of, of bulbs in there. Uh, it, it's already died down. It, you know, you, you'd be lucky if you can still find it. But you can you can dig it up and just move some of the bulbs anytime you want after they you know once they turn yellow and flop over and then plant them sometime in late september october by the first of november and you know give them a little space and they'll do fine but we typically plant them in the mid fall and uh, you can dig them anytime after they start dying down in the spring all right so dig them now and uh, keep them cool and dry and plant them in the fall yeah, you don't even need to keep them cool. Just throw them in a, in a, in a paper bag, and they'll remind you when it's time to plant because you'll start smelling them. But anyway, the the, the main thing uh, is, uh, in a, you know, and uh, are you leaving the place for good? I am. Leave leave some behind for the next people. Oh, I will. No problem. <laughs> and uh, when you when you replant them, put them uh, two or three inches deep and a little bit of fertilizer, and they'll do fine. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Appreciate it, man. Hands on the wheel. Yes, sir. All the time. And uh, fair winds and falling seas to you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Folks, we got a little cheesy tune I want to play just to sort of lighten things up a little bit. We got some callers on the line. We'll be back with more of the Gestalt Gardener and your phone calls right after this. Singing songs for everyone Sit beside a mountain stream See her waters rise 
listen to the pretty sound of music as she flies. Find me in my field of grass, Mother Nature's son. Swaying daisies sing a lazy song beneath the sun. This is Malcolm White with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. All right, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's Felder Rushing. My two flowers of the week, I try to feature something that's this a little showy that week and something native. Uh, the showy thing is, uh, and when I talk about summer blooming shrubs, you know, gardenias and crepe myrtles and roses and uh, altheas and things like that, I always forget about the repeat blooming azaleas. You know, they've only been around for you know, not that long. They're fairly modern. But uh, the, I, every week when I walk in, I pass this azalea as sort of a red color. I don't know. If it was an eight-pack of Crayolas, I would say it's uh, red. Uh, if a 16-pack, it'd probably still be red. 32-pack, that ain't exactly red, but it looks red. And it blooms and blooms and blooms in the middle of the summer, and I appreciate that. The native plant is a vine. Uh, some people call it cow itch because some people are slightly allergic to it. Trumpet creeper or trumpet vine. Uh, it's got flowers as big as my thumb. Hummingbirds stick their whole heads up in it, and bumblebees too. Great native vine, but plant it where you can walk around it or else it's going to get away from you. Um, anyway, uh, toll free, one eight seven seven mpb ring We're going to start out in Roscoe, we're talking with Roscoe in Centerville. Roscoe, I've been in, Center, in Centerville. Hello, Felder. I enjoy your program. Appreciate it. What's up? Uh, is it too late to plant watermelons and cucumbers? Ooh, not for cucumbers. Watermelons, maybe. Maybe. It takes, you know, uh, three or four months to get some fruit off of those, depend on, you know, the variety and all. But there are some varieties of watermelons that are fairly short season. And uh, because the the ground is so moist, and I mean, because it's so warm right now, they'll come up real quick. So I say you might be pushing it, but just I think you got time. And certainly with the cucumbers, the watermelons, you know, uh, just depends on the variety. But my rule of thumb, and I learned this in Mississippi State from a guy named Milo Burnham, who is our home vegetable specialist. He said the sort of cutoff for for uh, summer vegetables is around the first week or so in, in August. So okay. I, I get right on it. Okay, I'll give it a try. Thank That's, you very much. All right, appreciate it. Guesstimate. I am planting stuff right now. I planted some corn and squash last week as flowers, little groups of corn, squash around it, in with some flowers. Uh, I th- and I think it'll be kind of fun. It's not a regular vegetable garden, but it looks nice. Uh, now let's go down to Macomb. Hey, Danny, thank you for holding, man. What's up? Hello, Felder. Howdy. How are you today, sir? So far, so I'm good. Not so bad. Nematodes. Mm. They have been my enemy for years and years and years, and nobody knew anything about them, county agents or nothing. Well, they, I, they, I didn't I, know what what's that. I will say the county agent knows, but he also knows if he tells the truth about it, he, he, you're going you're gonna to argue with him. <laughs> You know, there's okay. there's some things we we learn early on is there's only so many things you can do about it and people don't appreciate being told the truth. But there are some things you can do. What are these in? Vegetables or flowers or what? Tomatoes and uh <clears throat> cucumbers, squash, 
and uh, most anything, even turnip greens. Yeah. But I, I found a solution. Uh-oh, okay, because I, I've, I've got three. I got, I'm holding my fingers up, and if you name it, I'm going to drop one of my fingers. What you got? Marigold. That, that's that's my, my far distant third one. Okay. No. I, I, I uh, was in the country of Georgia, and I couldn't understand the language, but <laughs> I saw some plants uh, on this television show doing like mine, mm-hmm. and he, and he I understood kind of what it was, and it, they're microscopic. You can't see them. Yeah, they're, yeah the, the kinds that we have problems with, they're really, really tiny. And anyway, well, I researched on the Internet here, and this man said you can plant marigolds around. It won't kill them, but they don't like it, and they'll run away. And it has worked for me. Okay, here, here's the truth about it. And, and, and this is one of those, you know, I hear a lot of things about gardening that are sort of true and not really, but sort of. Marigolds don't really repel the nematodes so much that year. When you plant them, if they're there, they're going to be there. But the way marigolds work, and this is research-based, if you'll plant marigolds one year and then turn them into your dirt the next year right. and plant them, then that suppresses them. So, it's, you know, planting marigolds the year you plant, that's not, it's the next year after you work them into the dirt. That's where it is. Right. The oil in the leaves, not so much the root things. So there's some truth to that, but you have to plant marigolds every year and then just turn them under. The next year, plant more and more and more. There's two other things you can do. There is a natural product, and I don't remember, I don't know what the, the current brand name is. It used to be called Clandosan. It's made from ground up, finely ground up, powdery uh, 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 shrimp shells, uh, shrimp holes, and, you know, uh, seep type things. And it does a pretty good job uh, of, of controlling them. Uh, but also, you can do what they call solarize. If you've got a part of your garden, uh, uh, and, and if you'll, this time of year, if you'll work it up a little bit, make sure it's moist, you know, not just dry, but moist, cover it with clear plastic and, you know, throw some dirt around the edge or s- something, the sun will shine through the plastic, superheat the soil in the dirt, and steam them to death. <laughs> but uh, it only it works best in the in the summer, not so much late summer, but it works in the the early to mid summer. So sort of in between crops, and it works best on small spots here and there, and that'll knock them down for to to tolerable level. And the last thing is, make sure when you plant tomatoes, get these things that are called. If you're you've heard of VFN VFN hybrids, the N means they're resistant to nematodes. Uh-huh. And they've got they've got their beans that are resistant. There's several different vegetables that hybridizes bread that are resistant to nematodes, and they'll have the a little parenthesis with an N behind their name, and that'll help a lot. I've even resorted to planting in uh, hay bales. Yeah, but all that turns into, and people from the south don't understand this, but that just turns into big old rectangular fire ant beds. <laughs> you know, I, I've got. Uh, uh, the co-op down here has a uh, in Macomb uh-huh. has a, 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 a fire ant, a ant poison. Uh huh. That's the best I've ever used. I don't know the name, but it's in a little can, like a paper can or can that's green, mm. and and Damn. that it, it smells terrible. Yeah, that would be the stuff called orthene. It smells terrible, but it works. It Just does. A it on a mound. Yeah, and even. Okay. even and a lot of people don't like to use uh, 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 chemicals in their garden, but this stuff, it only controls the ants where you put it. It's not sucked into your plants and all like that. But anyway, good right. luck with the marigolds. Good, I mean, they, and, and they're pretty, too. But now, if, uh, I will mention that marigolds smell like dirty socks to me. They you know? do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we appreciate your call. Good luck on them, man. All right. Thank you, Phil. Have a wonderful <laughs> All righty. Let's slide up to central Mississippi and talk to Ardell. He's calling from Risland. Hey, Ardell, good morning. Hey, Felder. What's up? Um, I want to revisit the fig thing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so last November, I rooted four different species, neither of which is a brown turkey. Yeah, that's good. Brown turkey and, is just okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so my plan is to take them down to my place in South Mississippi, and I'm in the watershed for the Escatawba River. Mm-hmm. And the the soil is very sandy. Yeah. And it doesn't have a high nutritive value to the soil is that a bad idea because it, it is 
It is a, met, a Mediterranean. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not a bad idea, but uh, figs do like a, a lot of organic matter. Here's how you do that, though. When you plant a fig tree, don't plant it like, a, like just a regular bush. Mulch, you know, with some uh, tree leaves and bark and stuff like that on top of the ground uh, for four feet all the way around, a four, five, six-foot diameter, you know, a big round or rectangular area of thick mulch. I mean, really piled on there. This fall, if you put eight or ten inches uh, over the winter time, it decomposes and is uh, and and works breaks down and has also worked in the soil by worms. And they'll keep that. So every fall, just put a real big thick ring. You know, don't pile it like a fire ant mound, but a big thick donut around there, completely covered in an area that's at least five or six feet across. That helps them a whole lot. And it also helps a little bit on nematodes. They don't like a high organic matter soil. Nematodes are more of a problem in sandy soils. But, um, you know, and that, that's the best I can recommend. Lots and lots of leaves. Uh, in other words, so, feed feed your worms, and they'll feed the organic matter around the roots. Okay, one more thing. Um, I did read that one of the biggest stressors for fig trees is lack of water. Well, it's it's kind of strange because they're they're native to super to biblical uh, lands. You know, that right. doesn't have a lot of rainfall. What happens though? We have so much rain over the winter time and the springtime. Roots end up being real shallow. And then it turns hot and dry, and they don't have any deep roots to help get through the dry times. That really helps with organic matter, though. If you'll put some mm-hmm. leaves, uh, have you heard of cottonseed meal? Oh, yeah. Cottonseed meal is not only nitrogen uh, for, for, for composting, but it's got protein for worms. And if you'll put a big, thick layer, just, you know, bags of leaves, neighbors put them on their curves, just pile leaves up around them in the fall. Thus, with the cottonseed meal, worms will put a lot of organic matter around, and they'll also dig deeper holes down further, and you'll have better air and water penetration and deeper roots. Okay, so uh, one more thing. So would you not, would that not be your highest recommendation, best recommendation for planting them? Well, you know, it, it, it's not it's not that big, you know, cl- figs grow all over the place in a lot of different kinds of soils, and it's a challenge. I have really heavy clay soil. You know, you're going to have sandy soil. The figs are going to have different kind of root systems in each. And the, the, the suggestion for either one is organic matter and feed the worms. You know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding like a, one of these old hippie type of people, but this works. It really does work. Feed the worms, lots of leaves, and your figs, will, whatever kind of soil you've got, figs will, the worms will figure it out. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. You bet. Okay. Good. Oh, oh, oh. When you put them in the ground, cut them back to a couple of feet tall, make them bush out. You want fig bushes, not fig trees. Okay. Well, these are, these have, I said, they've been in a pot since last, last November, and I was thinking I would plant them this November. That, that'd and they're be, no more than about two feet. Uh, that, that's fine. The main thing, uh, so I just planted one that, that I, it, when, the new, when the growth gets two or three feet long, I cut it halfway into, I'm making it into a bush so I can pick it without having to, to use a garden rake. Gotcha. All right. Okay, Good Bye. luck on it. And before we leave this next caller, I want to mention the Java. You know, I've been talking the talk all this time, but this summer I've been walking the walk. You've been doing the work. You really have. Last week I brought you some plums that, that I got from an orchard up in North Mississippi. A week before, some uh, purple Louisiana beans. It wasn't enough for a mess. I don't well, know. It was if fresh it, out of your garden, though. Yeah, yeah. I picked it myself. This week, I went out to a friend of mine, this guy named Robert Shivers, the old fig tree, and I picked three gallons of figs, just walking around the tree, three gallons of figs, and I put up, let me see, nine pints and 12 half pints. That's a lot of fig preserves. <laughs> yes, and, it uh, is. I, I used a little bit of, I didn't put as much sugar you know, a lot of the old-fashioned fig preserves, real, real sweet. I put less sugar, but to help make sure that it was preserved, I put a little lemon in with it. And uh, so it's going to be sort of lemony, figgy with a dash of cinnamon. With some cinnamon, yeah. So I, don't don't be surprised if you get a call Monday morning uh, to talk about this on Deep South Dining. That'd be <laughs> fine. And if you, can, if you can get your kids to do it, you know, have them put it on toast because it goes further. They eat it by the spoon. It ain't, you know, it ain't but a pint. <laughs> you know, not going to go very far. Uh, but it's one of the true things you can have here in the South. You know, up north they got cherries and apples and all that stuff. But folks... You can buy Vermont, you can buy cherries from upstate Michigan, you can buy Vermont maple syrup at every Piggly Wiggly in the South, but you got to know somebody, get some homemade fig preserve, just like my great-grandmother taught me when I was 10 years old. 
open up fig preserves. One last little quick antidote. I put the uh, overripe figs and the trimmings when I was making the preserves in a five-gallon bucket outside my porch. Went out the next morning, there was a baby possum swimming in it. Oh, po- Pogo? <laughs> no, no, this is the baby possum. Oh, it's- uh, another possum in my yard. Pogo is doing fine. I made a house for Pogo, by the way. Okay. That I'm going to let him loose soon, but I, I made him a house I'm letting him get used to to put up in a tree. But this little Pogo, this little possum had gone around and around this bucket. It was about, I guess, belly deep to the possum and just turned into mush. And I had to fish it out and hose it off. It was completely gunked up with sticky figs. <laughs> it had this little thing, it had fruit flies stuck to its hair. <laughs> Imagine the night that it had. It, it thought it was Christmas Eve or something. <laughs> well, this this is this is not the kind of stuff you can hear in other garden programs, folks. We're real here in the South. Let's slide to Madison, Mississippi. Roger, appreciate you hanging on, man. What's going on? Uh, I have a uh, several Grancy Graybeard trees in mm-hmm. my yard, uh-huh. and right now they're loaded down with purple. I'm assuming it's the seeds. Yeah. And uh, should I be afraid of our pets eating any, or our uh, granddaughter getting over here and, and picking up some and maybe eating them? You know, that's, that's really strange because when I was walking in this morning, a neighbor of mine's got a beautiful Grancy Graybeard, and I, th- because I got bifocals, you know, I haven't seen my feet for years, <laughs> and I. Th- thought that I saw some fruit on it, and I made a middle note to check, but I've never noticed that. You know, it's a native plant, so we know it's got the, the, the little seeds. I don't know that they're poisonous or not. I haven't heard anything about it. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't mean anything because yeah. it's not a... I know the birds are really eating them. I know yeah. that. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean anything. Birds can eat stuff that, that'll, that'll knock a dog on its tail. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, you know, if, if, you, if you can, uh, shoot me an email because I, I want to find out for myself. And I'm going to look at this one on the way back. But I, my gut feeling is I, no, it's not a problem. The kids are probably not going to eat them anyway, or not many, because they're not going to taste good. Yeah. And uh, your pet's probably not going to eat them. In, you know, so it's not like it's going to be a toxic thing. I haven't seen uh, a lot of poisonous plant uh, things that they have out there are about not plant, not not things that are toxic that are going to kill stuff, but can make you sick. Sick, okay. And, and a lot of that's written f- uh, for livestock. And so a lot of native plants that livestock can browse it shows up on these plant lists, and I've never seen Grancy Graybeard, which is uh, uh, also called American Fringe Tree, if you want to look it up. Uh-huh. Okay. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll be gl- I'm glad to find out for both of us. Okay. Sure to appreciate it. All Thank right. You. Thank you. And by the way, I got an email uh, last week from somebody. I was uh, I was incorrect on one of my, my recommendations. Somebody said that they had some... Uh, uh, so weed killer they mix up, surround them, they were going to spray it, but they had a big backpack and wanted to know, because insecticides break down. You mix insecticides with water, they start losing strength almost immediately. And I said, in general, weed killers don't. Well, come to find out that Roundup, if it's mixed with an alkaline water, which a lot of our tap water is alkaline, um, then it, 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 it doesn't last as long. You have to add some stuff to it. So. Uh, you know, there's a lot of nuances I'm not aware of. Anyway, the general rule of thumb, any kind of pesticide, natural, chemical, whatever, mix up and use what you need. And if you have some left over, try not to store it. Now, Felder, did you hear about this uh, new native wildflower garden in Ridgeland? I have, yeah. And it's mostly cosmos. What is that? What do you mean? Uh, it's a it's a type of plant with uh, sort of yellow orangey flowers, which I grow in my garden. They just threw a whole bunch of seeds out there, and they're saying, "Don't pull up the plants, but you can snip a few for yourself." And that's what that's what got me thinking. They were like, "Do not pull them up by the roots." Yeah, but because cutting, they keep on blooming. Yeah, but cuttings are fine. Yeah, but for the person who doesn't know what what's the cutting, or I guess if you cut too much, or you well, know. if you pull it by by the root, it's gone. If you just snip some of the flowers and little short stems off, it'll branch out and keep on blooming. Now, how do you take those cuttings? I'm purely asking snip. for myself. How do you take those cuttings and then go put them in your garden? Oh, no, no, no. This is just for, for a bouquet. Okay, bouquet. okay, okay. But now these things, they reseed themselves. This is Cosmos. Uh, is a is a is a real showy plant. It's a, a showy and it reseeds itself. So if you find some of the flowers that have dried up and they got the little burr looking, little seed pod looking thing, you can snip some of those, and throw them on the ground, and they'll sprout. But if the 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 flowers themselves are just for cut flowers, and there's always going to be some that are way past bloom and all the petals have fallen off. That's the seeds. Okay. Okay. 
Cool, cool. But thing. I thought I thought that was pretty neat that they said you know cuttings are are okay. <laughs> yeah, well, if you if you see this in Cosmos are uh, the polite word is prolific, prolific. There's lots of them. Because so many gardens, especially ones that are open to the public, they you know don't touch the flowers. Just, yeah, just look at them. Well, this is the case where they had a big open area and they just sowed a bunch of Cosmos seeds. You know, and it's not exactly a wildflower patch. It's more of a it's a cultivated patch of native. Cut flowers. A wildflower patch is weedy. If it ain't weedy, it ain't wildflowers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, folks, uh, those of you who like native plants, wildflowers, which uh, I'm, you know, I work with the native plants, the past president of the Native Plant Society, this is their 40th anniversary. Uh, it was started in 1980. I was one of the first members of it. 1980, the 40th anniversary of the Mississippi Native Plant Society. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to have their meeting this fall because of the social distance and all like that. But they're talking about doing a thing that, that can be done online streaming. Uh, folks, I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing. Go to felderrushing.blog. Click on Magnolia Flower Flag. We need more people to sign that petition to have a magnolia flower on our new flag. And if you don't live in Mississippi, if your heart's in Mississippi, you go ahead and vote. Um, meanwhile, uh, if there's some things I can help you with during the week, shoot me an email, garden at mpbonline.org. Raise your mower up. It's hot and dry out there. Lawns do better when they're mowed high in the summer. This is a fact. We're going to take a break. It's called a week. We'll be back same time, same place next week. And uh, if you get a chance, take a kid to a farmer's market or garden center. Not much at the garden centers, but hummingbird feeders and stuff like that. Anyway, show kids how to do what we do best, and that's get dirty. Support for MPB comes from the Woodward Hines Education Foundation's Get to College program. Based in South Haven, Jackson, and Ocean Springs.